Well, first of all, it's the first seminar of the year, so welcome, everybody. This is the first seminar of the year. Um, so you have been, you have, we understand that you have been re-elected director. Ah, uh, yes, I was in an email. Um, thank you for your confidence. Um, I'll continue ruining things in exactly the same way that I've been ruining them already. Um, I promise you. Um, the schedule for other seminars, especially this, this goes out as well online and for YouTube folks. Um, we finally do have them up. I put them up this morning. So on the Cephiz S website, we have an event calendar. You can see all of our upcoming events that we know about. Um, there is also, go ahead and do a little PR, uh, mid-October, the uh, Post-Darwinian Societies Seminar is restarting again for this year. This is a collaboration between us and the uh, folks over at the Hoover Chair, uh, Gregory Pontier. Uh, some really interesting speakers have already come out and will be coming out again. Um, so this is gonna be, this is gonna be fun as well. All of that is on the event calendar. So you can see everything on, on the event calendar, uh, the event calendar on the website. So, um, yes, and the first topic of the year is all of us. So, Alexandre. So, it's my honor and privilege to introduce you one of our home. Now it's, it's a tradition, the first all of us seminar, nobody wants to come. So there's always a local one. <laughs> of course. <laughs> This has nothing to do with quality. Each year it's a very good start, I remember last year. So, bef since we have a little bit, we are a little bit late in the schedule, I, I give you the floor, Kevin. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being there to the first seminar. I have the pleasure to start. And, uh, it's stressful as well, but uh, I will do my best. Try to speak a little bit louder <coughs> for the microphone. Okay. Uh, if I, at some point, if I don't speak uh, correctly enough, please stop me because. Uh, I will not notice it. Okay, so with this talk, uh, the title of this talk has been changed from what you may have seen on the poster. Uh, basically, I've uh, taken the presentation part out. It's just gauging what's physically meaningful, and uh, it will talk about the tension between theory and experiment, uh, particularly in GR. <coughs> even in GR, completely confused. So, uh, the aim of this talk in the end uh, would be to uh, convince you that uh, due to the importance of a symmetry group for an interpretive purposes in GR, you uh, have a specific case uh, where uh, the, uh, the authority from uh, experiment of the authority from theory diverge, and there is a tension to resolve that you have to resolve actually if you want to, uh, to uh, do metaphysics or if you want to pursue the physics that we have today. And uh, so it's a, it's a tension that is not trivial at all, and that has real, real consequences for both physics and philosophy. <coughs> so the outline of the talk, I will start by discussing the two authorities that I've just mentioned uh, for science, inside science, this will be a talk within science, and no, no question of manifest image of the world at all. Then I will uh, briefly uh, go through the symmetry, gauge, and representation definition that we use in physics and future physics, because I expect that maybe a lot of you didn't, uh, they were all good at this kind of stuff. Uh, I will talk briefly about the interpretation of symmetry and gauge uh, according to the two approaches that we will have defined at the first, uh, at the, in the first part of the talk. And then I will go to the GR interpretation. <coughs> okay, so two authorities in science. Um, there is a question that seems to have driven splits inside physical, physical communities throughout the history uh, about what is the legitimate authority to decide and to arbitrate uh, physical debates. And it's not a trivial question, and people have their own answers to it. Uh, in the 60s, we had the Sellers uh, philosophy and scientific image of men that, uh, that made the popular the idea that there is manifest in the, in the scientific image of the world. So you have two different theories already there, one coming from phenomena and from uh, our day-to-day -day life uh, picture of the world, and the other coming from the science and science practice. And, uh, but actually, there was another split uh, in the 80s inside the philosophy of science community, uh, which has been turned uh, turned to practice, uh, with uh, notable philosophers such as Hacking or Cartwright. And this, this kind of this new branch of philosophy has have diverged from the orthodox one by saying that the real authority of science is experiments, and so we should uh, do uh, more philosophy about experiments rather than just seeing everything through theories, as we used to do before that. 
Uh, one thing that, that remains though is that in physical physics they didn't follow the term most of the time, and in physical physics is still very orthodox in its way to approach things. So for them, theories are always, always uh, are still the, the thing that you should look at if you want to understand what is the scientific picture of the world. And uh, it's not experiment at all experiment, it's just there, just there to test theories. And the more fundamental theory is, the, more, the closer to the truth and the closer to the real picture of the world it will be. So you have two different traditions uh, nowadays in the field of science. <coughs> and these two traditions, from my experience at least, they don't seem to attack, to interact very much. So, um, provided that you are allowed that there is genuine ontological questions that, 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 are, that can, you can ask with experimental practices, you can divide the two traditions as two different ways to approach uh, science. One which is, which is top-down, where the ontological part of, uh, ontological relevant part of representations are coming from theories, are coming from uh, the uh, authority of theories, and they, they mostly transcend the, the specific context of applications. And you have a bottom-up approach, which is more in the turn to practice tradition, which uh, take as a source of authority the resistance of the world, so the experimental part of, of uh, science and the, the scientific pra practice are the real authorities and they are the ones that, that highlight the, the, the physical, uh, uh, physical, physical reason part of our presentation. Uh, as I said at the start, it's not a question of manifest against scientific. Both approaches are in the scientific and I will not talk about manifest at all in this talk. Uh, however, I, I expect that uh, in the end, since uh, our practice are based with our, our practice are made with humans, probably the bottom-up approach will be closer to phenomenal to tradition, phenomenological tradition, or more manifest tradition of doing metaphysics and physics philosophy in general. <coughs> so, um, at the start, one, one may uh, one may expect that the both approach coming from two different sides will be uh, complementary. So. Uh, just train different parts that are absolutely all not related and don't clash together, or they are training the same part of science. But uh, if you look if you if you look closely at how both uh, how you can how you, how you talk and represent things in experiments rather than uh, compared to how you find things in the theories, you actually see that you have two different two very different pictures of the world at the very start of the investigation. So I've written here a, a quote that I took from Crowe, who is a philosopher of technology, and one of the, one of the few books I know about philosophy of uh, experiments in physics. So he's basically saying that when you do experiments, the way you describe uh, the process and the easy way functions, your experiments are designed to do something, so there are functions, and the instruments that you use, they have functions to, to do something. And it's different from the way you <coughs> describe stuff in the theoretical level, because in the theoretical level, everything you see is structures and how things are related to one another without any question of uh, design and uh, the way to how things are made to in order to do something. So here already you, you have a divergence, so to see, and it may be trivial if it was complementary or the same stuff, if it was complementary. But actually, you can show that there are some parts of physics, at least, where the two picture clash, clashes. Uh, it can be seen with uh, very simple uh, instruments that we maybe have all used in uh, high school before, a mercury thermometer. Basically, a mercury thermometer is just uh, an instrument that you use <coughs> in the physical experiments to uh, measure temperature. But at the same time, it's also a technological instrument that requires a lot of design and a lot of thinking about in order to be able to do what we use it, we, we use it for today. So in this, this little object, we have two pictures of the world, the functional and the structural pictures that are clashing together. And so you can see that there are tensions that are not trivial and not easily resolved uh, if, you take, if you look at science from, the, from both ways. <coughs> so there, there will be a way to, to resolve the tension at the start, just go full empiricism, like radical empiricism, there is no question of ontology, it's just mental questions and uh, chaos. And there is not no much question to what was, but it's not very interesting. I mean, maybe for our project, but not for mine. Uh, <coughs> another would be uh, to postulate that uh, the properties that, uh, that uh, experimental practice, uh, the properties of experimental practices and processes do not carry over to, to theories. Basically, you just use them as a tool to get somewhere, and when, you, when you're there, you just take the, the ladder out and you 
stay at the, at the top of the, of the mountain. <coughs> but so that, that's the usual explanation of uh, of uh, theoretical people going from the top-down approach and the more theoretical part of it. But it actually requires self explanation because it's not obvious at all uh, why it would be so. Uh, sadly enough, this project is not uh, developed enough that I have a way to reserve attention, so I will just uh, stop at presenting you, at showing you that there is attention to it be resolved. So now there is something that is absolutely not trivial. Uh, earlier I said that provided one allows genuine investigation, ontological investigation of experiments, meaning that experiments by themselves have an authority, and it's not trivial at all, uh, at least in the future of the physics community, it's rejected from the start. Most people wouldn't even think about that or about that. Um, <coughs> so I, I, I could think of a, a few a few obvious objections uh, that I have to answer at the start just to get the project going. Uh, <coughs> first is uh, the traditional uh, theory of physics, uh, the fin theories, the top-down approach and theory approach. Uh, belief that experimental science is just a means to an end. It has no purpose outside of testing theories, so experiments are just there for, 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 te for testing pure theories. They don't uh, have other purposes, so in the end, the result of science is theories, and they are the ones who carry all the authority. That's one of the possible objections. Uh, another possible objection is that, uh, as, as we may all, uh, as we have a, 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 a position or seen at some point, Experiments are theory laden, if only for the purpose of creating and, uh, and designing our devices that you, uh, that you use in experiments. And another possible objection would be that uh, by design, experimental practice is a contextual human activity. So it's full with uh, subjectivity and conventionality and contextuality. So it may not get us to the true underlying scientific picture of the world. These are three, three different objections that would mo mostly come from the field of physics of orthodoxy. So uh, I mean, it's very, very, very crude, and uh, I haven't thought too much about that, but about all the objection. But uh, I would have some basic uh, starts, the starters uh, of objection, of uh, answer to this objection. The first is that, uh, against the first objection, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, there is no uh, independent authority for experiments. That in historical physics, uh, actually, we have a lot of cases where uh, experiments were there before theories, and we managed to stabilize, stabilize and uh, ex not explain but, uh, and measure uh, phenomena without having the theories to explain why they uh, to explain uh, to explain the phenomena. Uh, it's mostly seen in the, the development of telescopes that were there like f 50 years uh, before the first series of lights came out. So we knew how to do experiments with the telescope, and we we um, saw some chromatic uh, aberration, but we knew were aberrations and the truly part of the picture that we wanted to see with our telescopes before we had any uh, theoretical explanation for it. Another, another uh, case uh, would be from a quite famous book in the Physics of Science practice community, which is an to merger from Azov Cheng, which show basically that uh, the process of inventing to merger was not by one based on theory, it was based on a lot of experimental work uh, before any theory of uh, temperature was, was there, and far before any statistical mechanics was there to explain the theoretical form and form more than any dynamical theory that we had. So, uh, since phenomena are discovered and stabilized experimentally before, uh, a lot of time before we have theories, there is some authority that is coming from those experiments that is independent from uh, our uh, end result, uh, our theories explanations. And these, these phenomena are also stable enough that they survive through theory changes. So, basically, they are. They are still uh, they are more resilient than theories, so there is no reason why and they shouldn't have their own authority. Uh, and actually, this, this resilience of experimental measure is something that is a criteria usually taken in uh, physics to uh, accept a new theory. You want your new theory to explain the old uh, experimental result that you had with the former theories. If not, uh, your new theory is dead at the start. Um, a few answers to the objection that uh, of the theory lightness of experiments. Uh, if it pertains to a theoretical <coughs> framework that you have to use in order to understand uh, your experiments, as I said before, uh, you had a lot of uh, stabilized phenomena that, are, that were there before the experiments, uh, the theoretical the theory, theories were there to explain. So it's not necessary to uh, use theory to uh, 
so this experimental practice and phenomena, experimental phenomena. And if it's uh, related to the devices that you use and that you have to use theories in order to construct them, most of the time you want your devices to be constructed from other theories that you know are working quite well in order to uh, secure the theoretical uh, experimental stuff that you are doing without relying on the theory that you may want to uh, test with the experiment that you're doing. Otherwise, you would have a circle. Which you have and uh, regarding the conceptual and uh, subjective part of the uh, the experimental practice, well, yes, that's the point. And it's, it's okay to uh, accept that maybe in the scientific picture of the world there are subjective, subjective aspects of it and conceptual aspects that are physically meaningful. So, uh, as I said, these are quite uh, intuitively uh, the first stage of uh, thinking. So, if you have any comment on that, at the end of the talk, I will be very happy to hear anything about it. Okay, so now we are going to uh, be a bit, to try to be a bit pedagogical because I was asked to. Uh, I, I will start with a bit of definitions about wh what we are doing when we are talking about symmetries in physics and field for physics usually. So you may, you may be uh, familiar with the idea of uh, semantic approach of theories. It's basically a, a way to define theory and the orthodoxy in field for physics. So for ease of uh, the demonstration and of explanation, I will just assume it and not talk about the controversial part of it. So the semantic approach of theory is basically the idea that the theory is nothing but the collection of models that you, you can uh, that is defined through the, the laws of the theory. So you may uh, equivalently talk about the theory and the laws or about the models that uh, you use to uh, that are defined through it. So there is a way to, uh, to define uh, to represent representation uh, in physics. So at the, at the further left, uh, the color of the most color, okay. At the far left, you have the world, which is supposed to be a manifest image, if you want, or the bigger world. The dotted line that's crossing the, 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 the scheme, schema is to uh, separate between the manifest and the scientific. And everything to the right is the scientific part of the presentation. So what well, you see in this picture, uh, you have two different levels of presentation in physics. Uh, that, is, that, is not, uh, that is not uh, Necessarily a typical way to do it, but uh, it's quite useful when you think about uh, symmetries in physics. So, the B is basically a physical world, uh, it's a world according to physics, so it's a presentation that are already uh, highly uh, idealized and uh, where well, you have neglected a lot of stuff from the world in order to have a physical picture of the world. And what, but you don't, you don't have access to the B, what you have access to is the M and the M' prime, which are the mathematical models that you use to present the physical pictures that is there to represent the world. So it's a two-step process. So that's basically uh, what I've just said. The, uh, with, with some example, so the conceptual model of the target phenomenon in the world, which is the P that was at uh, the middle of the uh, scheme. And basically, an example of that would be uh, taking uh, the moon and the earth as point bases orbiting uh, around each other with gravitational forces. And the mathematical uh, description of it, so the M that was the further right of the, of the picture, would be the orbits of that, uh, the mathematical orbits of, uh, of the point mass per, uh, of the interaction of the point mass, would equivalent to the equation that describes their, their motion. Now, you, you may wonder what the M prime was, uh, because we already got the, the M. Basically, the idea of having M prime and M is to show that you may have some surplus, mathematic, math, mathematical surplus uh, in your mathematical representation. So basically, uh, mathematical structure that doesn't carry over to the physical picture of the world. So this doesn't carry over either to the world directly. Uh, and in your world, you want to say that you don't have access to this structure and it's physically uh, irrelevant to, uh, to the physical representation of the world. Is just there in order to uh, secure your uh, mathematical representation. It may be uh, coordinates, which are just a uh, tool that you use in order to uh, have a, a more useful uh, picture of, uh, of your uh, physical system. Uh, or, uh, the example I, I use is that it's complex numbers. We use a lot of complex numbers in, uh, in physics, and obviously, uh, you don't see complex numbers in the world. Uh, yeah, so you didn't see the color. <coughs> I'll go back again. The left picture was supposed to be the idealization representation. Uh, it's a representation that is 
uh, taking stuff out from the world inside the scientific presentation and the overall rating P and M is supposed to be, re be rating structures and not, uh, not uh, something else. Okay, so now that we have this, uh, these ideas, uh, what, what is a similar transformation? So for a given structure, uh, a mapping of the element of the structure into an M-self is called a symmetric trans transformation if it preserves the structure of S, of the structure that you started with. And uh, we say that if you have uh, a lot of these uh, transformations, they form a group that we call the symmetric group of S, and a lot of the time in physics you characterize uh, objects, geometrical objects, by their, by their uh, symmetries rather than by their physical properties or mathematical properties. Uh, the, the, the dual notion to symmetry would be invariance, obviously, if you, are, if you have a symmetric, uh, if you are symmetric under transformation, you have some invariant part. And these are notions that are only present in, uh, in physics. Uh, so, the symmetries that are mostly interesting in physics are symmetries of the laws, of the dynamical equations, which are the term you prefer, of our theories. So, granted the semantic approach, we can define the symmetry of the theory uh, as such. For a given theory T and its collection of model theta, the map is a symmetry of T if and if, if, and if two models uh, M1 and M2, such that M2 is the image of M1 by F, could present the same physical state of theta. Which, by which we mean usually that they are empirically, empirically uh, indistinguishable. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, the picture doesn't look very good on the screen. Okay, so uh, now that we have uh, made uh, uh, a way for definitions, we are ready to categorize symmetries, which will be useful later. Uh, there are several, several distinctions that we make in physics uh, according to the type of theory of uh, transformation that your symmetry is part of. You can say that a symmetry is active or passive. An active symmetry is a transformation that relates to mod two different models, uh, as you had before. That would be an example of uh, active symmetry that takes one model and goes to, to another model of the same theory. Or you could, you could have a passive uh, transformation, which is a passive symmetry, which takes which uh, is uh, relating different uh, coordination of the same model. You could say that a symmetry is continuous or that it, it is discrete. Uh, the continuous uh, symmetry is basically an invariance under continuous transformations, like the translation of uh, whatever system you, you want in the, in the mechanics, you translate it by how much uh, methods you want. Or a discrete symmetry, uh, which is basically uh, just uh, changing parameters in various and, and discrete transformations, like the time reversal in physics, the equation of physics most of the time are uh, invariants against the reverse, reversal of the error of time. That would be an uh, example of discrete symmetries. Uh, another distinction that uh, we won't use too much uh, is external versus internal. Basically, an external symmetry an external is a symmetry that uh, involves changing of location on the space time, the space and time. And internal symmetry is, a symmet is an invariance uh, transformation that do, not, that do not involve anything with, uh, to do with space time. So uh, basically, the external transformation, external of symmetry would be a rotation of a two body system. <coughs> you rotate them, it involves uh, changing the location in space time, but the symmetry remains because you only have two bodies. Or uh, internal symmetry would be uh, taking uh, two particles, uh, two massive particles, and just switching them, and it doesn't change anything. But you have technically uh, internal transformation. Uh, the only thing that we'd be interested out of the uh, definitions uh, that we had earlier of uh, these two, dif two distinctions. Uh, most of the time we talk about uh, continuous, or actually all of the time we talk about continuous symmetries. And uh, there is one mathematical properties of these symmetries that would be kind of, kind of useful, which is that they are all uh, sharing the same representation in mathematics, which we call uh, the Lie groups uh, for the technical terms. Basically it means that uh, every internal or external symmetries uh, they all, if they are all continuous, they all share the same mathematical structure. So what you say about one carries over to the other most of the time. Okay. Uh, la last no, yeah, la last uh, characterization that we need is different between what is the global symmetry and the local symmetry. So the global symmetry uh, is characterized by, by constant parameters. Like uh, if you take uh, if you take uh, whatever body in Newton mechanics and you just 
Et après, il y a euh, uniform uh, motion velocity to it. It would be a, a, a constant parameters of uh, motion that you apply to the thing, so it would be a <coughs> global symmetry. And uh, local symmetry would be a transformation that's characterized by a continuous function. So uh, that's, that's the example, it's a bit, a bit too uh, complex maybe. Uh, but basically, it's just that uh, you're uh, allowing uh, your uh, transformations to have parameters that are not constant. Now, intuitively, Uh, global symmetry group are just some group of uh, local symmetry group. It's just that the function of what you take is constant. So it's, it's basically there are some group of one over. And uh, if you want an uh, intuitive picture of a thing that is not accurate, uh, projected onto space time, so we are not talking about the, the laws anymore, but how they uh, are looking in the presentation, a global transformation would be seen as uh, taking the same transformation in all the points of space time. And the local uh, transformation would be like if you choose uh, at each space time the different transformation. Okay. So, well, now we'll uh, talk about the uh, important concept in physics, in uh, modern physics, which is gauges. And most of the time in daily life, a gauge, you may be uh, familiar with the concept, a gauge is a, a scale that you use to measure stuff, like you would have in your car, you have a temperature gauge for your motor, you have uh, fuel gauge or whatever, and uh, you can use different units to uh, parameterize this gauge. And uh, in, the, in terms of uh, the uh, presentation, the scheme of presentation, uh, when we add the two, uh, two uh, mathematical models for the same physical presentation, you could say that that has two different gauges that just co coordinate uh, the, the physics differently. Okay, so. Uh, The no, no carrying over to the modern physics of today, uh, what we call a gauge symmetry is usually just a continuous local symmetry, so according to the distinction that I gave earlier. And so a gauge group is a Lie group characterized by continuous functions. Okay, and uh, accordingly, a gauge theory is a theory that is uh, whose dynamical equations are invariant against, uh, are invariant under a gauge. Uh, under gauge. Okay, so how do you interpret these symmetries and gauges uh, in physics? Are there mere super structures, so part of the M prime that we saw earlier, or do they have physical uh, significance? That's one of the main uh, questions that you can ask about symmetries. Uh, intuitively speaking, uh, your gauge or your symmetry would have uh, physical significance if you would have a corresponding uh, symmetry or gauge inside the physical part of your presentation. So if it was just not, uh, if it's not just uh, The mathematical uh, carrying over of the structure, but it might change something in the, in the physical presentation of the world. Uh, yeah, for the, the, the bottom is cut, but uh, it's just that uh, I simplified the, simplified the model because I could have used active, uh, active symmetries instead of passive symmetries, and then we have four different uh, circles in the two Okay. So wh why is it actually interesting to look at uh, symmetries uh, in physics, and wh why what is the importance? If you look at the history of physics again, you would see that uh, the, research, the search for symmetries has led to a lot of uh, advancement in physics, and uh, a lot of the time, looking at uh, symmetries can inform you about the underlying uh, theoretical symmetries and the underlying form of your theories. Uh, the main example that we have, uh, that, that, uh, The prime example of uh, symmetry uh, used symmetry in the world used to uh, model uh, theories is the Galileo ship experiment that you may have heard of. So it's a quote that is directly direct taken from the translation of Galileo's uh, main book. Basically, if you shut yourself uh, with your friends in a small cabin under, under a deck of some, some ship without having any uh, access to the external world, And you have with you uh, animals, fishes, whatever, balls. And you uh, send your balls to your friend and send it back to you. You wouldn't see any difference whether the ship is moving or not. If the animals are running around, you wouldn't see, they don't, wouldn't feel a difference if the ship is uh, moving in uniform motion, sorry, or not. And so basically, uh, if you're inside of uh, the ship, you wouldn't, see, uh, you wouldn't see any difference if the ship was moving or not. You couldn't uh, do any measurement that would reveal, reveal if, the if the ship is moving or not. However, if you happen to uh, open the window and look at the shore uh, that is just in front of the ship, you could see if your ship is moving uh, or relative to the shore or not. But you just couldn't do uh, from the inside of the ship 
if it was totally, totally a closed system, you won't be able to do any measurement to, uh, to see if it's moving or not. And that's the main uh, idea behind the concept of inertial frames and that led, uh, after a lot of work, to uh, neutral mechanics. Uh, so apparently the other thing is uh, more controversial, historically speaking. <laughs> Uh, another kind of symmetry that uh, usually we, uh, we say is related to theoretic theoretical change is uh, the Michelson Morley experiment, which shows that basically the speed of light is uh, equivalent in all directions, and there is no, there is no uh, such thing as, as, a, as an interfere. That was one of the positions to uh, carry over after Newton mechanics to propose that there is uh, absolute uh, restraint of the universe. But uh, apparently, it's, <laughs> it's historically. Uh, more controversial. Uh, no, what is what may be a bit uh, surprising, according to uh, uh, in contrast uh, with what I've just said, is that if you look at the uh, physics uh, community or uh, even in physics, you would have a lot of people who think that, sim that uh, symmetries are not uh, not uh, phys 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 physically relevant. They are mere, mere surplus, surplus structures, so they are just other ways to uh, describe the same picture of the world. So uh, for, for gauge theories, for example, you have people who uh, qualify them as surplus structure, formal redundancy, descriptive fluff. And uh, the guy who says it is descriptive fluff is uh, one of the greatest uh, fields of physics that we have. And he says that uh, it's basically the common way to see gauge in physics. So we should adopt it in fields of physics as well, according to him. OK, so that, that is the tension that we have in the uh, understanding of uh, interpretation of uh, symmetries. So that's the tension, that's, that's why what is the quote that is just uh, summing up the tension that I just uh, described. So there is something about tension in two aspects of symmetry in physics. On the one hand, there is a widespread consensus that two states of affairs created by symmetry <coughs> transformation are really just the same set of affairs differently described, so the field of physics uh, point of view. That is, two mathematical models of physical theory are related by symmetry transformation, and those models represent one and the same physical set of affairs. So the symmetries are purely formal, they have no uh, carryover to empirical stuff. But on the same side, on the other hand, as I said, uh, if you look at the history of physics, uh, there is a lot of uh, counterexample to that, where we have thought that uh, symmetries in the world have, uh, yeah, have um, correlates in the theories. And so we have a nice paradox that is nicely summed up there by our good friend Quentin Rion. Uh, if symmetry transformation relates representation of identical state of affairs, how can they have any observable con consequences, including presumably the one from which we are inferred? Okay, so there is a way to uh, dissolve this apparent paradox. Uh, it's to recognize that when you talk about symmetries, uh, I think I, I, I've put the emphasis on that when I was talking about the value of ship. Actually, you're not, you're most of the time you're talking about uh, symmetries on the inner system. And uh, you should be, uh, should recognize that, uh, that your system is not the, most of the time it's not the full uh, space time, it's not the full universe. So the system is part of the environment. <coughs> and if you're, if you're in the environment, there is a good chance that you could observe uh, symmetry happening inside the, the subsystem. So that's the thing with the Galileo ships when you open the, 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 the window, or if you are in the shore and you're looking at the ship, you will see if the ship is moving or not, even if inside the ship the symmetry is holding off. Holding off. Okay, uh, so um, this, idea, this idea that you, uh, most of the time in physics you can separate uh, a subsystem from its environment, you can isolate a subsystem from its environment, is something that is used most of the time in physics to uh, have models of a small part of the world, and it's how you could understand that some theories, uh, some symmetries have empirical, uh, empirical uh, relevance, even if they are mostly a description of the same, so the same uh, set of, of affairs. So basically, the physics is the same behind it, but the, uh, you, could, you can see it if you're outside of the system. Uh, in the first instance, though, uh, it seems it's not possible to do the same thing with gauge theories, uh, gauge, gauge uh, symmetries. As I said, gauge symmetries are continuous, so you can change uh, their, their value at each point of space time if you're talking about the gauge inside the presentation. So, if you don't uh, take pay, pay too much attention to the boundaries of your, your system, you can always set up the uh, symmetries to be uh, the value of the gauge symmetry inside the system and the value of the identity outside the system. So, the symmetry would carry over to the world, and then symmetry is the symmetry of the world and not of the system of the world. That's basically the uh, orthodox way to understand gauge symmetries. 
one of our dogs will talk to the symmetry. So now I will talk about uh, three different uh, ways to understand symmetry according to what I've just said, uh, to, to the distinction I've just made and the picture I've just uh, drawn. So the doxa of uh, theoretical physics is uh, invariantism. The idea that uh, two, sy two, model, that, uh, two symmetrical models are just denoting surplus structure in your theory, and they are relating empirical, empirical indistinguishable state of affairs. And it's something that is uh, a long-standing tradition in physics that uh, comes with uh, that with nice invariantism, which basically links invariance with objectivity, because it's something that apparently, uh, according to Nozick, is has been going on for a longer, longer time, and uh, we have done, done that in physics. Uh, we have here a definition of what objectivity means. Objectivity means for Weil. Objectivity means invariance with respect to a group of automorphisms, so a group of uh, transformation of uh, transformation. And it's something that is still present and still the most orthodox way to do to understand symmetries in physics. In physics. So uh, here is a guy who said that uh, gauge symmetries are descriptive fluff. Uh, the point is that in the theory which give gauge freedom, what is real or objective is what remains after the gauge freedom is removed. So basically, uh, the gauge freedom is just uh, mathematical surplus. You, you cut it out and you still have the same physics. And uh, it's, it's something that you will see in other uh, texts uh, from other famous people in the of physics. So uh, from the invariantist standpoint, gauge freedom is basically distract distracting you away from what is the underlying uh, mathematical structure that just uh, relate to the physical structure of the uh, representation. So they are just uh, something that is there to mislead you into uh, thinking that it has some reason uh, for ontological and uh, interpretive purposes. So most of the time they are reductionists and they just uh, advocate for cutting out the surplus and uh, working with uh, the reduced theories if your purpose is to interpret to, to, is to interpret the physical reasons of your theories. Uh, but they don't uh, contest the idea that gauge freedoms and, and coordinate system and other symmetries are very useful when you apply to the world, just that it's uh, secondary, it's not very interesting because clearly these guys are part of the orthodoxical way to do uh, physics, so they are on the top-down top -down approach. What is really relevant is the theory, is not the practice. Since uh, gauge freedom is mainly, mainly practical, so it's mainly used in experiments and scientific practice, it's secondary, everything else that is relevant is in the theory. Okay. So now a uh, middle point between the uh, uh, invariantist, the top-down approach, uh, the bottom approach that I will go to uh, later. Uh, in, an, uh, in, a, in a famous article, uh, Riven and Wallace are trying to seek a final analysis of this uh, subsystem uh, and this uh, subdelement division used to understand uh, the paradox uh, that I showed earlier. The way they do that is uh, that they axiomatize the relation to non the and, uh, and, and symmetries. Uh, environment and the system to the subsystems, and they show how the symmetry uh, relates to the distinction between the, what is the subsystem and what is the environment. And the, the most important part of this paper is that when they are talking about this uh, division, what they are talking about that was not talked about in the previous papers, that were just that are all in the theoretical approach, is that they are talking about uh, pragmatical consideration of how you isolate your system because. In physics, uh, we always assume that you can take a subsystem of the world and you can just say, well, it's isolated because uh, the, the, <coughs> all the forces act on it outside the system are negligible. But uh, even if they are negligible, they are still there, so it's always an idealization. So you have non trivial boundaries when you isolate systems. And uh, in the context, uh, these, these boundaries are context, context dependent. So uh, you have a semi pragmatical approach of uh, understanding symmetry. So it's uh, kind of a middle point between the fully top-down approach theories uh, first and the bottom-down approach practice from like your question first. And uh, well, the, the, the other important point is that uh, basically in the end, what they, what they see is that uh, is that uh, some gauges some gauges can have uh, relevance, physical, physical, physical and electrical relevance. So uh, they don't agree with the previous point, uh, previous uh, position about which uh, symmetries are uh, physically uh, relevant. Okay, so the last uh, approach about symmetries, uh, bottom-up approach. So uh, again, our, our friend uh, Quentin Royon, uh, with 
visitor of the is a friend of the center, I think. So he has written this uh, very good paper that I wish I had uh, written myself. <laughs> <coughs> because basically, he, he, he's saying everything that I wanted to say uh, before, before coming here. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's a good example of uh, what, I, what I had called the bottom approach at the start. So starting with pragmatical, uh, pragmatical uh, consideration of the practice and taking them to mean something and not just uh, secondary uh, to the theories. So the, the article is basically an attack against the first position that I showed, the environmentalist reductionist pictures, is uh, very against the reductionist part, because then if you are fully reductionist, you have just eliminated all the symmetries, and you have no way to understand the symmetries that you used to, you used to uh, infer the physical symmetries. So in the end, you have some, some issues of understanding what's happening. Uh, the, the example that he talks about, about is like is uh, is example of uh, surplus uh, symmetry, a uh, surplus structure that you shouldn't deal, uh, get rid get rid of. Is the idea of coordinate system, coordinate system, and the related symmetry to coordinate system. Uh, basically, the idea that uh, you can uh, parameterize uh, every every allocation in the world by uh, by numbers is usually taken to be just surplus structure. But if you look at it from a practical point of view, it is very meaningful. And uh, according to Quentin, uh, from a pragmatist standpoint, uh, they have a function in uh, practice in science, which is to be indexical devices that refer in context and tell us how we should measure the, quantity, the quantities that the model describes. So they are, they, are, they are applying a scale to uh, physics so that we can do physics in context. Then. So for him, uh, interpreting, uh, interpreting a coordinate system in context amounts to adopting a particular class of, of operand visualization for position measurement associated with concrete reference. So basically, you are, when you are choosing a coordinate system, you are choosing how you will measure along the length of uh, the TV table or the length of whatever else you want to measure. So it has operational meaning, so it is useful in practice and you shouldn't get rid of it if you want to understand how you practice, how you practice science. Uh, so the important part, uh, in contrast with uh, the over two approach, is that uh, it's related to what scientists actually do, and uh, not what, the, not the, what the, they end up with, not the result of their practice. So uh, this uh, practice, you can see, is giving meaning to uh, what was thought before to be near, uh, near surplus structure. The position that he his position, he calls that, uh, he calls that perspective sense in, in opposition to the previous uh, environmentalism uh, position, which he calls uh, universalist stance because it promotes a view from nowhere. It's a view that, uh, where uh, perspective and subjectivity have absolutely no, uh, no relevance and that they should get, you should get rid of everything that has to do with perspective. And, uh, and in, the in the contrary, if you follow Quentin and if you accept the perspective sense, you have a new understanding of what is symmetry and what are surplus structure in, in physics. Uh, for, the, for practical context, basically there are model structure that represent, represent uh, the possible perspective that you have on the physical system that you are trying to study. So there are model, model, model uh, describing a, a structure of possible perspective uh, on top of the physical, uh, physical uh, aspect. But that is that is somewhere where you can uh, link uh, as I said earlier that the bottom approach is closer to um, some manifest uh, picture of the world. This kind of uh, you have an object uh, system in this case, and you, uh, you you have to adopt the perspective to look at, the, at it. It's kind of reminiscent of something that you can see in phenomenology with Husserl uh, or whatever. So yeah, this this uh, text is very long, so I won't read through it. But uh, basically, the important part is that uh, through this approach, which is taken from the other side of the other two, he has another, uh, he, he, he doesn't end up with the same uh, symmetries having uh, relevance. And basically, for him, all the symmetries have uh, physical and ontological relevance, and you can just get rid of them. And it's uh, different from our perspective. So you see that all the three, three approaches, they all diverge in the end on how they interpret the symmetries in our Presentations and in our, in our series. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, it's a supply motor approach. Uh, the justification that he used for uh, his uh, position is that it's more faithful to, for the scientific, scientific practice. So, we just see the bottom up. Okay, so uh, summary of uh, this, uh, this approach that I just talked about. We have seen, uh, and I have shown you, three different positions on how you, can, you, you could interpret symmetries. One which is the orthodox guaranteed one, top down. One which is the middle one with some pragmatic consideration, but still the, the former, uh, sorry, the former uh, theoretical approach at the start. And the fully bottom up approach, or uh, as full as possible, uh, for, as I as have seen in the literature. And uh, as I, uh, it, it seems that through this approach, that all shows a different uh, relevant part of symmetries. You can see that the tension I talked about at the start between the different approaches of, of, to, to the way to interpret physics is actually uh, something that, that carries over to the actual uh, interpretation of physics. It's not just uh, me uh, in, my, in my corner having weird thoughts. Um, the choice of this uh, particular interpretation uh, is not uh, chance at all, it's because. As I said at the start, uh, for GR, uh, symmetries is uh, basically the symmetries of GR are. You the should say what is GR. General relativity, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that uh, once. No, not okay. once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so general relativity. Yeah, uh, I, I wrote it in the, in the title, right? Yeah, no, it wasn't written between you. <laughs> no, but for people that. No, no you're right. right. No, it did, did, did right. Sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so it's uh, general relativity theory. Uh, the main inter interpretative points uh, are related to its uh, symmetry group. So obviously, uh, what we just used uh, is kind of useful to understand what we are, what is happening in uh, general relativity. Okay, and uh, why general relativity as well is because uh, I believe that it's the most spe spe spectacular case of a tension that you need to resolve between the bottom-up approach and the top-down approach. So. Uh, yeah, it's not written, so it's general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, orthodox pictures? Oh, yeah. There we go. Now, there it's there it's, uh, it's in two different forms, the general relativity or general theory of relativity, which is the same thing. Uh, so to date, it uh, still is our best uh, theory to describe the interaction, the gravitational interaction and the geometrical aspect of space-time. It is basically defined by uh, following three uh, elements, a field, which is a gravitational field, and also the metric, uh, for the dimensional metric. But uh, it's called uh, the metric because actually the gravitational field can be seen as the space-time of uh, general relativity. The gravitational interaction is uh, basically a <coughs> geometrical uh, interaction between uh, the matter field. So you, you have a geodetic, geodetic equation, which tells uh, an equation that tells you how masses move in your space-time and how they move uh, in the metric that uh, <coughs> is defined for the equations of Einstein's ancient equation, which are the main field equation that you use to uh, define the structure of your space-time and the curvature of it and how it looks. And you define it, uh, contrary to previous theory, you don't define it at the start, it's not something that is fixed, it's something that is part of these nice uh, equations. So they are written in very compact ways, in very compact way, but basically these equations, this equation is actually 10 equations in one. So if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, to have fun doing math, uh, you can straight solve that. I've done it, it's not fun. Uh, so yeah, the geometric space-time is not fixed a priori. It's a result of an equation, and it's related to the way gravity, gravitational uh, field uh, relates to the distribution of energy and matter in the universe. Uh, if you want to know what each term means, uh, you have uh, notations, but uh, it's not very useful. The only thing you need to know is the metric. Metric Gimunyuki, which is the geometrical aspect of space. Now. So, if you follow the semantical approach that I defined at the start, uh, GR can, can be GR activity, can be defined uh, as, a collection, as a collection of space times that are the solutions of the equation that I showed you earlier. Basically, what, what you find in rich literature is that you define uh, these models uh, through triplets uh, M, which is a differential manifold, so it's uh, just uh, the geometrical. Uh, ge Geometrical objects, but uh, it is there to, uh, to be like the, the barest space time you can imagine with a few uh, geometrical uh, structure on it that allows you to do physics with it. G mu nu, which is the part that tells you uh, what are the distances, what are the length and uh, the 
the proper time that, uh, that uh, processes take in space time. So basically, it's, it tells you uh, everything you need to know about, uh, about the, what the length, times, and uh, all these kind of uh, informations when you do physics. And the O is just a generic term to replace every geometric field that you would like to put in your theory, matter field, electromagnetic field, whatever. Um, so, yeah, so, as I said. so the, the interesting fact about these equations is that they are invariant again uh, under a group of space-time symmetries, which are, that are called the deform deformorphism. And the deformi deformi deform <coughs> sorry, it's hard to say. The deformorphism is an arbitrary map uh, that, uh, that is from that takes uh, something from the space and put it to back to the space time. It's just an arbitrary function that is uh, sufficiently smooth. And basically, you could uh, apply whatever smooth function you want on your space time. You would just uh, circle around the class of solutions of your space time, of your equations. So, uh, as I said, it's a continuous map. So, in the terms that we had earlier, it's a continuous external local transformation. Continuous because uh, it's a continuous map. Local because uh, you will change uh, at each, each space at time point. You have to uh, set a, a value for the form field, and external because it uh, takes stuff and you move stuff around in space time. And the nice thing is that uh, mathematically, when it's represented by a Lie group, uh, it's characterized by a continuous function. So all the debates that were earlier, that were most of the time not settled in the in the general relativity, but more mostly in the quantum with quantum physics example or. Uh, other side of this example, since all the gauge transformations have all the ma same mathematical structures, the consequences can carry over. Okay, uh, one thing that I will need also is that, uh, as I said at the start, you have two different ways to see transformations, an active and a passive way. And so, uh, accordingly, you have two different ways to see your diffeomorphism variants. Either you uh, take it that uh, they uh, just are record, uh, they just change the coordinates on your space time. And they don't take you from one level to another, or you take it as they are, as they, they are being dynamical equations. And then what they are doing is not uh, recognize your, your space time, but they are uh, shifting the fields, uh, the geometric fields over your, your manifold. And yet, they, so they take you from a from model of the theory to another model of theory. And it leads to the very famous and much discussed all argument uh, that you may know, or may not know, but I will. Talk about it again, sorry if you know it. Oops, sorry. So basically, the idea is that uh, you can have uh, space time as uh, nice as you want. So, we, something that is not trivial in general relativity is that uh, your space time has, uh, has uh, surfaces for which uh, your uh, particle trajectories pass only once. You, you could have uh, <coughs> time travel with your space time and you don't want that so, so to have a dynamic situation. So you can have the nicest uh, space time you want with every uh, properties guarantee, guaranteeing that uh, the trajectory are deterministic or as deterministic as you can. Since you have a deformorphism and variance and uh, you have the active understanding of it, what you can do is that you can select uh, a, a hole in your, in your space time, a region of your space time, that you can shift. You can just apply the deformorphism inside the hole Remain, keep the rest of the space time fixed, and so you would have shift the solution of uh, the trajectories of your particles inside the hole if you believe that the models do not uh, relate the same physical situation. So if you, if you break uh, the Lamistan rule of uh, principle of. Uh, which one is the game? Uh, uh, differentiation principle. Mm -hmm. if, if you, do, if you don't, don't believe in that, that you believe that, uh, that you can distinguish empirically the situations uh, in the space time, you will be in a kind of a weird position because then your trajectory can be shifted uh, any way you want by just applying different physics to it. So basically, it forces uh, in the, in the uh, mind of people who presented this argument, which one of which was uh, the guy who was saying that Kate Chilich is Arts Kitty Fluff. Again, always the same guy, but uh, he's very influenced in physics. Or Einstein. 
Oh, ein Stein ist ein, das tut. Und das war eigentlich das T-Shirt. So this beef you don't treat the deformism as gauge symmetries in the sense that they are just a description of the same physical situation you are threatened with in term determinism. Okay. Uh, I was in the orthodox picture by the way, so the invariantist picture. Okay. Uh, so no quantum gravity, which is where the fun happens and uh, I didn't have much time to uh, write the slides, so I don't know how much uh, <laughs> understandable it would be. Uh, a few few points before, uh, if you don't know, general relativity so far has passed all the empirical tests that we found at it. Uh, the latest being the detection of gravitational waves in 2015 that led to the Nobel Prize, that you may have heard of. Uh, but we know that it's not a final theory. We know that uh, there are objects in the universe that uh, require us to couple uh, quantum matters with gravitational uh, fields. So we need a, a theory that go beyond general relativity and incorporate the quantum part of the physics. So we need a few theory and uh, the question is how do we do that? Uh, we expect that the new theory, uh, if it's not a totally unrelated new theory, but, but there is not a lot of prospect for that so far, if I'm correct, there is a good chance that uh, it will incorporate the features from general relativity and features from quantum physics. So each proposition can be seen as a the proposition of understanding what is physically and ontologically relevant in both quantum physics and general relativity. So whoever wins at the end is the one who had a better understanding of physics today. Uh, okay, so that's the technical part, but I don't have much time to write. So I'm sorry if it's <coughs> understandable, bless you. Uh, so the equation that I have shown you earlier is written more or less in what we call the relation. <coughs> So the Lagrangian formulation is not a uh, description of a system uh, that you evolve step by step. What you get uh, when you uh, do the dynamic equation is you get the full history of the system. So in the context of space-time, you get the full space-time at the end of the solution, uh, at the end of the equations. And uh, the, that, that is kind of an issue because the only way to know how to quantize the theory, uh, so far at least, is to uh, put this in another, form, in another uh, formulation that actually uh, take uh, the system we defined uh, state uh, to, to, have, uh, to be defined by a, by a, by a state that is uh, indexed, indexed by a, a time function or a function. And so uh, the, uh, we, need, we need to uh, have a theory in the step by step <coughs> solution uh, formulation to be able to do the quantization of uh, your theory. And for well behaved theory, it's not too much of an issue because, uh, mathematically speaking, you can show that uh, there is a transformation. But for well behaved uh, theory, uh, uh, say, transform uh, the Lagrangian formulation into the Hamiltonian formulation, and uh, there are basically equivalent x to the form. <coughs> but obviously, uh, it's not the case uh, with general relativity. If not, uh, to be uh, too simple, uh, I won't have a job. Uh, so. Basically, when you uh, do GR, as I said, uh, you have uh, solution, the solution of the equations are complete space time, for which you can respread the field on it with the uh, deformism uh, transformation that I showed you uh, with the whole arguments. So, what we can show is that the initial value formulation is not well posed for GR. Uh, what is the initial value formulation? It's a uh, property of theories in physics that tells you that if you have uh, all the uh, all the information for a given state at a given time, you can say for this state how it will evolve at the next, at the following step of time. And that is not possible in GR because of the particular, particularities of the symmetries in the field. So when you uh, try to, uh, to uh, switch to the Hamiltonian, you cannot do it uh, in the same way that you would do it with uh, the theory that you managed to put in the quantum, quantum uh, physics formulation. What you get, is uh, this very poor hybrid <laughs> picture. Uh, you get an interminism and you get uh, in your phase space, so in the space of the states of your system, you get gauge orbits. So you get again orbits of equivalent, equivalent class of uh, states according to the, to the dynamical rules. 
so this gauge orbit, if you, if you uh, use the top-down uh, orthodox uh, approach, there are gauge uh, symmetries, so there are surplus symmetries, so you don't, you don't want to, to work with them, basically. Uh, the, the thing you want to do is to find some uh, invariant quantities that you, could, you can use because they would not be uh, interesting, they would have determined evolution. And you can do that uh, actually in the Hamiltonian, uh, constant Hamiltonian formalism, the one that, uh, that, that has these orbits. If you take uh, any quantity that is constant along the orbits of the equivalent uh, representation of the states, of fiscal state, uh, you have an invariant quantities that evolve deterministically, deterministically and uh, mathematically is well defined. But now you have an issue that you may have not expected at the start, but uh, here it comes. Uh, these, uh, these quantities uh, do not evolve in time. They, are de they evolve deterministically, deterministically, but their evolution is pure gauge, and so they don't evolve in time, they are frozen, and they are defined. Right? So if you, if you uh, want to say that in an invariantist position, everything that is relevant in physics is invariant of the gauge, then you are forced to uh, adopt the idea that uh, the general relativity, according to this formalism, uh, gives you a, a frozen picture of the world, no change at all. Uh, and uh, this, this is just the start of the computation of quantum field of, uh, of the quantum uh, quantum formulation of uh, GR. If you go all the way, you will end up with a problem of time that uh, you know it's a very famous problem of uh, quantization of, uh, of uh, general relativity. Okay. And to resolve this problem, as I said, as you, as you see, it's an issue of how you understand gauge. And so the issue, uh, to, to resolve this issue is to go on the quantum theory of uh, gravity. You need to understand what is the, ga what is the gauge of uh, GR robots. Okay. Uh, so as I said, you have adopted the Tordon approach. So you are an inventist. So you, have to for you are forced to, adopt to, uh, to accept that uh, your physical picture of the world is frozen in time, uh, not frozen, frozen to us, frozen uh, at all. There is not even a uh, big change for those who know what, what it means. Uh, <coughs> well, these are our results that we have uh, arrived at by looking uh, forward to this new uh, quantum theory. But actually, you could just have used uh, the regular diffeomorphism uh, because the only, uh, in most cases, the only uh, quantities that are invariant against diffeomorphism are global quantities, so quantities that are defined for all of space-time space are constant of, uh, from the, for the all of space-time, so they don't, they, don't move, they don't change anymore. They are frozen in time as well. So whichever side you want to take it, if you believe that uh, GR is a gauge theory and that the gauge is meaningless, you end up with a physical picture of the world that is frozen. Okay. Uh, no, uh, uh, how does how it look from the other side? Uh, I haven't had the time to do much uh, work on that yet, so it's very crude. But basically, uh, experiment is, as, as in every uh, theory, when you do experimentation, you're forced to do them somewhere, sometime, and to observe physical changes. If not, uh, what is the experiment? I don't know. So uh, if you look from the top, from the bottom up, you have to uh, to find somewhere something that moves, and you can show that uh, non-invariant quantities in, in space-time do uh, change. The only issue is that to be able to uh, measure or to see these non-invariant quantities, you have to set them against non other non-invariant quantities so that they uh, cancel, uh, so that the invariance, uh, the non-invariance cancels cancels in the quantities according to the other quantity becomes invariant quantity. In applications, how does it work? Uh, you can show that uh, what, what we do in experiments, at least in the most relevant application of TR today, which is GPS uh, system, what, what you do is that uh, with your uh, satellites, you are fixing a physical uh, frame of reference. And this physical frame of reference is basically uh, as if you are choosing, choosing a gauge for your theory. So basically, you're just fixing the gauge, you're not reducing everything to invariant quantities. You're fixing a gauge. And so when you're fixing the gauge, you can see uh, what were non invariant quantities before. Just you can measure them with uh, this, this fixed reference. So from, from practical side, from practical side, this fixing of the gauge is very similar to uh, what Quentin was doing in his uh, bottom-up approach to the theory earlier. So it's the idea that uh, 
you engage the relation between the system and the observer, and fixing uh, the gauge is like choosing a perspective on your system. And this, this uh, to show that it's not just uh, we have philosophers doing stuff, but this, uh, this uh, idea that is shared by the one of the most uh, renowned uh, philosophers of uh, quantum gravity, which is uh, already with favor or favor of uh, the loop quantum gravity, one of the main approach for uh, quantum theory of gravity. He has written an article on that, so, which is quite inspiring, inspiring. And so uh, it's not just uh, philosophy and metaphysics in the end, it's also physics, because the, these ideas, he has put them forward in his, in his new development of the loop quantum gravity, and he said that the root of what he thinks is the way to understand the GR. And so it has uh, an impact not only on metaphysics and, and philosophy and the scientific picture of the world, but also in uh, how you do physics uh, after, uh, after, the, after the divide that we have today. Okay, so as I said, uh, you have two different pictures, uh, two different approaches to, uh, to a theory. One uh, which is a top down with this picture, with which, with, with which you end up with a frozen picture of the world. One which is bottom up and uh, requires changing quantities or require uh, location in space, location in, stand, in time, require fixing gauge. And so you have two very, very different pictures of the world that are actually opposite to, to, another, to, to one another, so cannot coexist. And there is a tension there to resolve, and as I said, it's something that you have to resolve if you, if you uh, want uh, to advance toward the quantum theory of gravity. So uh, that's more or less my conclusion. Basically, the, the tension that I talked about between the two authoritative <coughs> sources in future science is cannot just be dismissed as a non-concrete, non uh, trivial uh, community uh, divide. It has concrete uh, consequences both for our, our understanding of what is relevant in, the, in science and for scientists in some part of science. And uh, in this regard, I think GR is probably the most spectacular part of science where you can see this divide. Obviously, a lot of work is done. It is really needed to uh, understand what exactly, uh, how exactly GR is applied to the world. This is something that I've just started working on. So I have not much to say about that yet. Thank you. So traditionally there's a comment, but I think my comment will take the form of three questions because, because it's already late and we had some technical problems. And I want to leave. So do you want the question all at once or one after the other chronologically? One after the other. Okay. So, I think you're right that these, there's two kind of authorities, so theory about the world and, and stability of a phenomena. But why? What is the source of this authority? Why should we philosopher use that source to solve the physical question about the ontology of the world? I see a, a priori metaphysician would say, I don't care. Maybe I, I should need some compatibility, but... So why philosopher of science inclined to do ontology thinks that they are a good source of authority? For you, for example? Well, before, before talking about me, uh, I can talk about uh, the project that is, uh, or community that is, uh, that is starting to rise, to rise that I've heard about uh, not so long ago, which is called Inductive Metaphysics. And then basically, the project is to uh, Inductively, uh, inductively infer uh, metaphysical uh, insights from uh, practices. The main uh, advantage would be that uh, it's not an inference of explanation, it's an induction of uh, part of uh, experimental practice. And if you're lucky enough to prove that, so you have some transcendental part of the practice that you cannot do without, and it uh, leads to a quite uh, solid uh, metaphysical picture of uh, metaphysical, metaphysical insights. Uh, as for me, uh, I, I was driven to this uh, two uh, approach uh, mainly uh, by my work on general relativity, and uh, it's, it's mainly that the tension between both uh, that, that there is so, such incompatibility in both pictures that I found quite striking because it's kind of uh, similar to another uh, received uh, view that you have in metaphysics of time that you have. 
but divide it, you know what is the scientific picture of time and the uh, manifest picture of time. But if you look at the uh, physics uh, from the practice and from the more uh, human practice of that particular approach, you have less red divide. And so uh, as a way to chart the possibilities, it kind of helps to bridge between uh, to bridge the scientific picture of the world and the more uh, mundane or traditional metaphysical picture of the world. After that, uh, in terms of uh, how you solidify, uh, how you legitimate in using uh, metaphysical thing with practice, uh, there are some limitations uh, if you're uh, looking at case studies to uh, infer some metaphysical insights. You better have strong argument that it's a transcendental part, <laughs> it's transcendental because otherwise it tends to not carry over to other uh, practices because their practices are more different, uh, I would expect, than the theories. So I can, I can see limitations, but I'm not sure uh, exactly how to answer what. Because if you do an induction on practices, mm -hmm. you can do an induction on practices, theoretical practices, okay? Yeah. So that, that's the top down. But the bottom up, it depends on what kind of part of practices you're doing the induction. Because for example, if I say, you know, human needs to organize the, the, the okay, humans, a typical Cartwright example, human needs to use causality to plan experiments. Therefore, causality is indispensable in the practice. Therefore, I should induce on it, causality must exist in a form of another. Yeah. But human are in the system they are studying. Who knows? <laughs> if something that we need to do is good enough as an inductive base to, to get to ontology of the world. It's related it, because it's bodies in the world doing stuff, but it's difficult to do the job. Yeah. Theories are as human as practices in this way. If you're talking about what uh, theories are thought by humans, they are constructed by humans with their limitations. So, no, I don't think there is that much of a divide. There is maybe more okay. much of degrees than the real divide between both. Okay, but the, your point will go directly, so it's a segue. You provide your own segue, so that's a great. For my second question, because this is. The question about pragmatic, so so <clears throat> this bottom-up approach of the semi-bottom-up of Wallace and Reeves, which is taken much more seriously by the community of philosopher of physics, as you know, okay. is to include a little bit of uh, of uh, pragmatic stuff in the in the in the in the recipe to get to the ontology, which was absolutely forbidden until recently, and. It's always including some spatial stuff or some perspective stuff or some measure stuff. But if if you except if you explain to me that these coordinates and this measurement and this spatial stuff is extremely special, like in the Neo-Kantian philosophy, any kind of pragmatic should do the, the work. For example, theory with surplus of structure can be quantized. Theory without surplus of structure, except maybe GR, cannot be quantized. I want a quantification because I need a quantum theory. Therefore, they are better. Gauge must be okay because gauge surplus must be okay because pragmatically I cannot do without. But it's not related to a perspectivism in the sense of a to have a, a situated point. So, wh why this? So I, I would be surprised that you agree that any kind of pragmatic considerations should be included in an ontological discussion. So why this perspectivism is better is the one that we shouldn't make an induction on. Well, the difference is that pragmatic, because pragmatical consideration, they are involving ways to uh, apply theories to the world, way to relate theories to the world. They are not. Uh, how much consideration about how you do and how you conceive theories. So there is more of a resistance to the world to what you're doing. But there's a lot of resistance of the world if I cannot get a quantum theory since all classical theory are false. 
I'm playing the other the yeah, yeah, yeah. now. I need a quantum theory. The world is saying to me the world is not classical. Yeah. I have to find a way to get there. Well, could you More or less. Could just be boolean. Could be boolean, yeah. Okay. But it's still quantum. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything smart to do with Okay. So you're not jumping in the pragmatism train at all. You're still a realist. In just I'm adding a little bit of perspective. I'm trying to be as um, as realist as possible. I start very realist. Okay. I'm trying to not, 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 not go too much uh, flip picture. Uh, there is nothing okay. in the world. For my last question, can you put back the uh, red head pictures, please? One of the red head, any, any of the. <laughs> because. Is it fine? The redhead perspective is rarely discussed because it's it's a little bit strange, but I think it's uh, it's quite useful for that kind of debate. So any any of the schema, yeah, you could put the simplest one. So what is very interesting in redhead? Is this is an old idea he had in the 70s. You know, is that the physical model or the P and the mathematical model mapping the physical model is not the same, which is never discuss in physics. So I, you can guess that in P, there's things like modal claim that do, are not in the mathematical model. There's maybe things about qualitative properties that are not in the mathematical model. On the other hand, what they share is structure. And it's maybe ambiguous how a mathematical structure could fit, or in what way a mathematical structure could fit a physical structure, even if it's a model. And after that, what, what is in the world physical structure is probably even more complicated to fit. But what is interesting is that the problem of gauge in general relativity could come on the fact that it's a mathematical model. So there's some stuff that is not there, like model claim that would change, for example. If you don't have to, uh, a way like you, uh, some kind of strong change notion, so uh, a becoming notion, contrary to difference notion, something that is not easy to represent mathematically. Of course, you don't see it. So, is there is a first screening. Uh, so it's not impossible that the screening is even before a symmetry. It's there is no possibility to get a full time, a full notion of time in the mathematical model because it's math. But, but that is something that uh, I've already called, yeah, that I was, was leaning towards when I was and, thinking about it. And it's maybe very difficult to see when you don't have this distinction between Fair. two levels of modernization, no, which, which I think fits physics. I'm not sure it fits other disciplines, but it, fi it fits very well physics, that yeah. you have two levels of, of uh, modelization. I would expect for uh, science which relies less on uh, the mathematical parts to infer stuff about the theory or what would be. Would be le 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 over few science that are less structures, I would expect to not have this. Kind oh, of me, I would expect that um, if you have a, a science where there's a lot of causal claim, mm -hmm. of course you have mathematical language, but you don't try to interpret mathematical structure. Mm. which is different. And in a very highly geometric science like physics, you all the time you interpret mathematical structure, not just mm. use mathematical language. Yeah. So you agree? Totally. Okay. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, when, when I was just thinking about uh, change, uh, is change just difference at the start of my physics? Basically, what I, what, I, what I was thinking about is that the mathematical way to present change is uh, uh, an obstacle to have, an obstacle to have proper metaphysical change in some of the field and physics. That was why I wanted to have like more. But, but contrary to your first argument, it was coming from metaphysical consideration. Now it's now yeah. it's just science modelization. We would do something. Like no, when you were arguing that mathematical structure are not rich enough, oh, yeah. it's because you thought that yeah. in the scientific model must be a metaphysical one, which is not necessary. You could just have 
more richness of things you can put in a model in P that you could put in M. But now I, I should give the floor to, to the room because we start late. We still have half an hour. Yeah. Question, comments. You can check online, please. Yeah. Uh, when I yeah, I have a question, but I think it's very stupid. That time it's true. <laughs> you always say that. You no, always. You must be crazy. It's just. Um, I'm not sure I grab the three concept. You know, I know it's very well used, and I, I will use it also in practice. But theoretically, it seems very difficult to be defined. You know, the, the example you gave was uh, complex number. Like, okay, there is no such a thing as complex number in real actual physics. But we could say there is no such a thing as number, maybe, you know. Uh, so it's not very... It seems that when we use the super concept, we try to have a mapping from theoretical uh, objects and mm -hmm. physical objects, a kind of one-to-one -one mapping. And I wonder if this is really a good way to look at it. And, and, I, and I think it's stupid because I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. the answer you gave was beyond that. So that's why. But I will, I will give an example. For instance, in quantum physics, you have Hilbert space, you know, and you use it for uh, your tool. But uh, the equation by quantum physics is not a, an actual Hilbert space. At some point, you have infinite integral, and it doesn't match. Uh, so, but it doesn't mean that Hilbert space has a surplus. It's more like an analogy, like a quantum equation behave like Hilbert space, even if it doesn't. Uh, satisfy all the property that is needed to be an actual inverse. Uh, so it's like maybe more about structure and uh, analogy than about mapping from uh, theoretical object and physical object. And I wonder if this uh, talk about what is it to be a surplus could help in the discussion or if it was already contained into your explanation. No, I, I, the, the boundary is uh, what, what is surplus and what is probably relevant to the presentation is always very fuzzy and always very hard to uh, to define. That's why we do interpretation of theories. It's the purpose of a theory to uh, interpret what is actually physically uh, playing a role in your, in your uh, a a physical role in your uh, ontological and physical role, role in your presentation, your theories, and not is not just there to facilitate or to uh, to have a way to do a mathematical thing with physical stuff. But uh, for, for your mapping and structure uh, point, I'm uh, not too sure I understood because uh, usually when you say that you're mapping stuff, you're mapping structures to structures, and the, the main uh, orthodoxy in philosophy of physics is just that you have uh, theories are structures and they map to structures in the world, and uh, there is not much uh, mapping of objects to objects directly. Yeah, th that's why I said my, my remark could be stupid. You know? Oh, it's not stupid. <laughs> because in one hand, I know it's structure to structure. Yeah. On the other hand, I feel like when we try to find what is a circle, we are like mapping object to uh, a symbol into the theory. And that's why I don't know if you are just stupid or if there is a kind of contradiction somewhere. No? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure because in, in the case of symmetries, uh, what you're trying to map is structural part of your, uh, your organization. The symmetries are structural parts. Mm -hmm. They are not uh, object in the sense of uh, entities that have uh, tau just uh, non-relational and just uh, there. Yeah. There, there are mapping stuff mm -hmm. to stuff, so... Yeah, but for instance, the two examples I gave. So the first is about uh, um, complex number. Mm -hmm. So here we say a complex number doesn't exist. So it yeah, seems to be one-to-one. No, one, no? Well, maybe it was an in the Yeah, yeah but maybe that's... Okay, and the other one, uh, with Hilbert space, uh, I don't see where is the circle exactly. You know? what, can we, can, what can be removed? Exactly. Uh, you know, it's just that what we manipulate physically are not Hilbert space, and we use Hilbert space as a view of mind. Just to so I, I don't, I don't see where would be the super exactly. I guess it depends on how you interpret quantum mechanics, because I know people who believe that the wave function is the yeah, same yeah, that maps yeah. to the world. I so guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess just a matter of in number space, you reduce the, the phase to have the, the ray. So there's already too much structure in the Hilbert space that you have to get rid to get to get the quantum mechanics. The idea is that there's another representation that is reduced mm -hmm. and seems to be as good. Because a priori you don't know you have a structure until 
you have another representation that seems better with less stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you can use a full Hilbert space, mm -hmm. and suddenly you discover, yeah, but to have the good prediction, I need to go to the ray, so I have to get rid of these these uh, these phase that does do not seems to do something compared to other phase that seems to be very relevant. Yeah, and yeah. you get rid of it. You just mm -hmm. cut, and you say, oh, it works. So it was a surplus. You didn't know before. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's about finding the minimal structural model yeah. that apply to your not very data. I know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of related to the on the antism stuff, even fundamentalist, fundamentalism stuff in physics, the more fundamental you are, the closer to the truth you are being, you're being so. In the simplest, the simplest you are, yeah. <laughs> closer to the truth. So, but in some way it's very independent of autology. About the question of knowing what the physical actual objects are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, what do you mean by actual physical object? You know? No, I mean, mm -hmm. since it's not because a one to one mapping, yeah. I mean, the question of whether it's circular or not seems to be independent to ontology. And I, I, I call the ontological question mm -hmm. question to know, uh, you know, is, if, if, is it, it is true that electrons exist. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, if you believe that, uh, if you're not a structuralist and you believe that uh, there are genuine objects that relate to the world, you have the uh, the thing, if you're a dispositionist, for example, and uh, you believe that the real stuff are objects with causal, causal power and uh, disposition, what you will relate to in, in, in your representation are the structures. So the structure, in a way, are surplus that are there to modelize the modality inside the disposition, I guess. Yeah, so it's. No? Yeah, but in that it case, it's that structure has several definitions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's why I was confused. So now I understand why I was. I, I was working in the very yeah, orthodox way to see structures, mapping structures, mm -hmm. and doing everything with structures, which is the easiest thing to do when you use. Yeah, you, you were into the context of structure, and so you have this definition of structure. Okay, okay, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we? So I have what I'm afraid might be a mean question, so you can just decide not to answer it if you like. This is, I'll put it this way you're absolutely allowed to say that this is for the future of the project that you don't know yet. But one thing that I'm really interested in, so I really like this idea that actually engaging in manipulating the world by means of the theory is sort of forcing your hand to resolve these questions in ways that, that some of the people who are dealing from this pure theoretical top-down perspective, that they're not really seeing what it is that needs to be done there. One thing that I think is really there's an interesting move that I think you're going to have to make, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how you're going to do it. So, how can you generalize the account of an experiment? Do you know yet? Because it seems like what you'd really love to be able to say, if I'm like reading the vibe of your talk right, like what you'd love to be able to say is like, this is what a generalized intervention in GR looks like, and every time you make one, you have to make a call like this, which means you have to be engaging in this gauge fixing enterprise, which means like this is a really natural way to interpret what's going on. But like, but you've got to be able to say what is an intervention in GR in the world in the right kind of way. Do you have do you have like even just like speculative random thoughts? I know you don't have like a theory yet. I'm not even asking for that. I think it's a really cool move. Uh, I just want to hear more. Actually, it's something that I talked about with Alan Jury back in Vienna, and he, he kind of uh, crushed my spirit and was like, oh yeah, I do metaphysics experiment, inductive practices, and I was like, yeah, but you know, case by case studies differ very much, so it's very hard to have a generalizable picture of your study, but if you look at the way uh, people are doing inductive metaphysics right now, uh, they are very non-specific non uh, uh, way to describe stuff. So, if there is a last man in the uh, uh, room, no, Köln, in Germany, who is doing inductive metaphysics, and he has these books where he's trying to defend the, the project of inductive metaphysics. And basically, what he's doing is he's, he's looking at experiments and the side of experiment which is related to uh, causality, prediction, and everything like that. Okay. And he's making argument but the, the the general form of experimentation and the thing you do in experimentations to uh, induce stuff about laws and how laws uh, should work in experimental, in experimental uh, setup, uh, which is different uh, apparently from what, how, how you would think about law uh, 
usually. But uh, it's true that if you don't have a strong argument that what you're describing is a transcendental uh, part of the experiment and not just contextual, it's, it's the hardest part, part, I would say. Uh, but that's the, that's the part I want to end up with because cool. uh, it's, it's part of my, my thesis to I mean, well, the way I, I see the, the future of my thesis. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to show in a way that in experiments, uh, the modality of experiments allows you to say that the change is, uh, is uh, primitive and time is a measure of change and uh, the, that change is a model concept and that it stems from the way you experiment. But that's the hardest part is to to ensure that it's not just all uh, that's something that you do in your, in your corner, but people are doing so much different stuff. Yeah. And actually, that's something that I was kind of concerned a few days ago because I was looking at an experiment of, uh, of uh, GR, and w one of the reasons why you don't have much at the end is because I thought there was a lot of cool stuff, but uh, in the <coughs> end, it's mostly just uh, you have these uh, two mirrors in space with an exam between them, and the right after a wave pass, and you have a difference, and you have no, no dynamical stuff, you just uh, Difference of the frequency of the laser is just as the gravitational wave has passed, but uh, there is no dynamical side to it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a difficult part of the project. Yeah, that doesn't, give you what, that doesn't give you what you want. Yeah. No. Cool. No, that's great. Thanks. Check, but the, uh, the thing that I've been thinking about, uh, the thing that maybe for another uh, PhD student, PhD project, <laughs> not for me, uh, I guess for uh, experimental physics, uh, for quantum physics, it would, be, it, it would be quite interesting because one of the biggest parts about interpreting, uh, and the hardest part about interpreting uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics is that you have this uh, mysterious stuff that is measured, and uh, so you, have, you don't know. Uh, exactly, but from the theory uh, in physics, how your theory relates to the world and what the experiments that you're doing mean. So if you are trying, if you should look, if you should look more at the, what is actually do, done in experiments, maybe you would have better understanding of actually what is quantum mechanics, and maybe you would constrain the possible interpretation of quantum mechanics from the bottom up. Probably it's a purely speculative. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked at all, but. Uh, and is there a link between a mature theory in uh, general relativity and in quantum physics or not at all? We, we have a theory of measure in the... Uh, ah. But I don't know if it's, uh, it can be related, no? In uh, general relativity. Uh, in the measurement problem is not yet in general relativity because we don't no. have a quantum theory. Ah, I mean that's However, okay. you're absolutely right that there's gauge symmetries yep. everywhere. So if your analysis general relativity is blah blah blah, it's it should be interesting to look if it's it works for other gauge symmetries. Because all fundamental theories are gauge. Mm -hmm. okay. Are gauge All of them. That's why it's strange that it's a, just a surface of structure. It's a very, very useful <laughs> surface of structure. Uh, I mean <laughs> even more than it's just useful, it's uh, in particular physics, it's how you, you characterize the view of the object in the theories you're, you're dealing with. They are characterized by the like, gauge. So. But still, we don't know what is no, the, the reduced theory. No, we don't, we don't but if physics is making use of symmetries as a way to characterize objects in your theory, you would expect that it's really strange if it's just surplus. Yeah, so. that's true. No, maybe it's surplus because we, we don't see what it really represents concretely. No? It's so abstract that maybe yeah. we, because we have this one to one map, you know, okay, yeah. so we are thinking, oh, it should be something. I've never seen the boson or whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> but the relative to, to, to Notor, I wish you were meaning that, but the, all the Notor parts about the Notor theorems with uh, the consideration of gauge related to symmetries, it's very relevant for general relativity and for everything else. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to see that it could be applied to other topics. The question are mostly about physics, but it could be about objectivity, invariance, symmetry. Oh, but uh, yeah. 
project in Estonia? If you have objections, critics? I mean, you have a very naive question. It's kind of stupid. Um, so I was wondering the whole time that, that like the top down and uh, bottom up, uh, where does it come from? Like, why would you call theory up? And, and experiments down? What kind of order is there? <laughs> um, I mean, in a practice, you have both, and they are not even, I mean, you, you constantly go from theory to, to, to experiments, and then, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a process, and, and scientific process, and yeah. th there is no order, I mean, except maybe like a sociological hierarchy, where maybe people find the pure, uh, uh, physicists higher up in society, the, the academic world. I don't know. I mean, what, what is the what is for you? The, do you see an order? I see, yeah, at the start, uh, I was kind of uh, inclined to call to call them like a platonic, platonizing approach, an Aristotelian approach to the hierarchy <laughs> of the spheres, of the vertical spheres, and the bottom of the world. And you, you take your hierarchy whatever you want, but uh, the hierarchy is there, and whichever part is most relevant is. You want the, the, the strategy, like the antique hierarchies, the uh, theory is up, the sphere, uh, the sphere of uh, even is up, so. but the okay. entities is <laughs> up, I guess. <laughs> but, but it's because the community is obsessed by theory. Yeah. It's the supreme way to get yeah. to the world. So it's like an aesthetic evaluation <laughs> or yeah. something that I'm just the theory would be more up. Oh, that's probably. Yeah, that would probably be sociologically supported. You could probably <laughs> run a survey, and physicists would be like, that seems right, yeah. Now you close now. Yeah, just a question for clarification because I, I lost track here for a moment. Can you can you re explain the, the intermediary position? The you should say that yeah, yeah, by Wallace and Reeves. So, so what exactly is, is there? Position. So uh, they basically they are uh, following up on the, on the paper by Redding and Brown on the, this idea of uh, if you take the subsystem and the, the environment and you look at, uh, look at it uh, from a theoretical point of view, you don't see a uh, gauge theory having any empirical significance because you can always set up, because they are very careful with the borders, the frontiers of the system, you can always set up your frontier to be smooth and then you put your gauge theory to, uh, to extend to, uh, to the whole system, so the gauge has absolutely no like, meaning uh, in the sense that we are discussing. Then you have uh, Wallace and Greaves in 2014, who uh, said that uh, maybe when you do that, you should be more careful about how you uh, neurologically patch your subsystem to the world, because the frontier, since the isolation of the system is always a fuzzy part in, in physics, you never have like a truly as a system, so it's always kind of weird to, to set up. So if uh, the boundary is not just trivial, it, it has uh, relevance to uh, the account of how gauge symmetries could have meaning. And uh, basically that's the, the idea is that the, the difference between global symmetries having meaning and local symmetries having no meaning, uh, an uh, meaning is not the right way to see it. The right way to see it is uh, Different in interior symmetries, so symmetries that are purely uh, defined on the subsystem, and symmetries that are defined uh, on the subsystem plus the, the environment or the old, old stuff. Yes. And then, uh, if you look at it this way, if you're purely inside the subsystem, uh, the, these interior symmetries, you wouldn't see anything because it's the equivalent of the Galileo ship. But if you are uh, looking at uh, the broader pictures, the way you set up your border is uh, absolutely crucial because. If, it's, if your, uh, your symmetry preserves the boundary, then you could have a relational, uh, I'm not, not sure, I don't want to say anything wrong, but there is some ways in setting the boundaries to uh, have uh, gauge theories having empirical uh, counterparts uh, counterpart, counterpart in the world. So, so uh, the, uh, the pragmatical mm -hmm. aspects came from, uh, come from this uh, idea of looking at the boundaries of the system in context to context uh, situations. Thanks. To answer uh, Peter, I have a quote of Tim Maudlin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the basic idea is simple. Metaphysics in so far that it is concerned with the natural world can do no better than to reflect on physics. 
physical theories provides us, provide us with the best handle we have on what there is. And the philosopher's proper task is the interpretation and elucidation of those theories. <laughs> but the practical in particular, when choosing the fundamental posit of one's ontology, one must look to scientific practice rather than to philosophical prejudice. <laughs> the practice uh, is there, but it's theoretical practice. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say something that's very important. And I could find one of us failed, it's exactly the same, and they all, all they say the same. And David Wallace was saying the same too, but now he's a little bit more subtle. But it's, it's in this book also that he refers to the point you were making before, I think, between the mathematical representation of your physical models that it's the mathematics that may be limited and, and then some of the problems that we see may come from the fact that you know, our mathematics is just not rich enough or not the right kind of language to try to represent certain of those physical effects like them or they call them or they they don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's philosopher from the previous for the previous generation that were more sensible to experiments and these, I mean, these it's pure theory, that's yeah. it. Yeah. But the, I mean, they, they came after the divide I mean, basically like uh, with uh, Cartwright and all the eighties guys, you had the uh, the committee that was still the same stuff and just that after what they split and people are just in their different branches. Mm -hmm. And I went, when I went to the PSP in, in Ghent uh, this year, and I was talking about physics and metaphysics, people were looking at me like, who are you? What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And the reverse, when I, when I went to the Philosophy of Physics conference two years, uh, one or two years ago, and I was trying to say, well, okay, maybe uh, you, are, you know, maybe you should look at practice, there's different stuff. And I was the same, same, like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. So it's very two different, very separated communities today, from the format of experience so far. It's not really a, a question about your talk, uh, but it's about something you said uh, specifically, and I'm a complete outsider in the philosophy of physics, so it's maybe completely known for, for the philosophy of physics. Um, you said something like uh, two physical states are considered identical if they are empirically indistinguishable. But that's the way it's set up in the literature. Yes, so let's give you an idea. It's extremely strange from a philosopher's point yes. of view, no? Yes, yes. It introduces an epistemic uh, notion in an identity relation and physical states. But the, the, the idea usually is that uh, the structures map to the world, so if you cannot distinguish empirically what's happening, then your structure is not mapping to uh, one stuff. So you don't know what is happening there, so it's the same. It must be, must be the same stuff. But, it, but you're right, it's, it's a very strong empiricist position. Yeah. yeah. Like, and do they, do they really think about it? <laughs> Why do it's such a strong empiricist? And what does it mean to be empirically indistinguished? I mean, it's mean indistinguishable it's by who? Uh, by, 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 by us with our present um, observation techniques or by yeah. the principle or. They are not always very careful with that. When they are, they are saying that uh, according to the measurement apparatus that you use to test your theory, that's the uh, most careful I've seen in the literature so far. Most of the time it's just uh, indistinguishable by an ideal measurement that you could think of, I guess. That you could think of? Uh, Another uh, I mean, <laughs> epistemic notion. <laughs> But that's something that I've always had. Uh, I can of think of a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things. But it's kind of a, a part of the physics today is that most of the time when you read the, the papers of literature, they are never expliciting what they are meaning by stuff because they have been doing the same stuff for 20 or some 40 years. And so and the debates about all this kind of stuff happened like 30 years ago. And nobody, there are, no, 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 I know, uh, nowadays nobody talks about that because it's so ingrained into the discuss, discussion in the committee that people don't even think back on it. So. You just assume that everybody, everybody knows and everybody assumes that somebody else knows. So you just continue. Thanks. A quote.
quote of Asfeld, if science were able to speak for itself, there would be no need for metaphysics at all. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's true that you are working against the current. Yeah. Well, but we've seen that. We but it's strange because this current, as as you said, was more diversified forty years ago, and people like hacking and Cartwright yeah. and. They were all discussing, oh, it's not sure, how do you get the, the ontology from this thing? And uh, maybe you remember during like, the defense, the uh, first question I got from the outside uh, committee members were, uh, but uh, you're looking at things from the experimental, but you will never find time from that. <laughs> you have to look at the theories in the very structuralist way, so like, otherwise it's not general. So, yeah. very, very much against the group. Last questions or comment or beer time? As usual, physics is so complicated by <laughs> logic that it's always better with a beer. Yes. <laughs> we will better understand later.